today we're going to look at an introduction to Kerberos. This is not SAS specific and just looks at Kerberos in general. In this session, we will introduce what Kerberos is and how it works at a very high level. As part of this, we will introduce the key components and some of the things you need to understand to make Kerberos work for you. I'm Stuart Rogers with SAS and this is the Technical Insights and Expertise Series. Let's start by looking at what Kerberos is. To understand Kerberos, let's look at the problem Kerberos is trying to solve. On our networks, we have a wide collection of different devices, be they servers, clients, or other devices. Most of the protocols we use to communicate between these different devices do not provide any security themselves. Protocols like SMTP, HTTP, etc. Within our network, multiple tools exist that allow bad actors to watch the network traffic and hence possibly view and steal credentials that we send across the network. So given this is a problem, what sort of solution can be developed? The people at MIT looked at this general computing problem and proposed a protocol to solve the problem, the protocol being Kerberos. One of the key things Kerberos enables is the use of switchable strong encryption. The encryption algorithm used by Kerberos is not fixed. If we define a better algorithm, Kerberos can make use of it. And Kerberos is all about authentication. That is, proving to each participant the identity of the other participant, whether that is a user or a service. Kerberos operates with a zero knowledge proof. That is, the participants demonstrate they know something without ever divulging the thing that they know. Now we have a brief understanding of what Kerberos is, let's look at some key terms and definitions. Within Kerberos, we have three different pieces as the participants. So effectively, there are three heads, which are the Kerberos Key Distribution Center, or KDC, the client, which is attempting to connect to something, and the server hosting the thing the client is trying to connect to. Just like the Kerberos from Greek mythology, the Kerberos protocol guards access to our network resources. The Key Distribution Center is the trusted third party within Kerberos. Both the client and the server must trust the KDC. And it's the trusted third party that is used to verify the authenticity of the client and the server. The KDC, as the trusted third party, is the key to the Kerberos implementation. If we consider a Windows environment, then Kerberos forms part of Active Directory. Kerberos is central to the authentication that takes place within an Active Directory domain. The trusted third party, in the form of the KDC, is an integral part of each domain controller. For each domain controller, a KDC process will be running on that machine. The storage used by Kerberos is the main Active Directory database. And Kerberos is central to the standard domain logon. Every time you log on to a domain in Windows, you are using Kerberos. So that addresses Windows. But remember, Kerberos is not a Microsoft protocol. Kerberos can be completely separate to Windows. MIT, for example, have a complete Kerberos implementation. This means the key distribution center 
can be run on many different platforms like Linux or Unix machines. Equally, the client portion of Kerberos is supported across many different platforms. For example, the Red Hat Identity Manager software that enables you to build a domain completely from Linux machines makes use of Kerberos. And Apple uses Kerberos across the OS X family in both server and client versions. Now we've spoken about the KDC, let's look at the high level process of using Kerberos. First, the client authenticates to the trusted third party, the KDC. This could be part of logging on to the domain or an activity happening later. Part of this initial authentication generates a ticket granting ticket for the client. This is sent by the KDC back to the client. Next, at some later time, the client attempts to connect to a specific service running on a server. So the client requests a ticket to authenticate it to that specific service. Rather than re-authenticate to the KDC again, the client presents the TGT as part of this request. If the request is successful, the trusted third party, the KDC, presents the client with a service ticket. The client then provides the service ticket to the service it wants to authenticate to. It's then down to the service to validate the service ticket and hence validate that the client is who they say they are. In our later sessions, we'll look at these tickets in far more detail, but at a high level, this is how Kerberos works. The most important thing to understand with Kerberos is the following. When we use Kerberos, the actual credentials are never sent across the network. Instead, each side of the communication uses the credentials as a key with an encryption algorithm to encrypt something. Then, when the other side is able to use the same key to decrypt the message, we prove that both sides knew the credential without ever having to transmit the credential. Now we'll look a little more at requesting access to a service. First, the client must be able to uniquely identify the service. The client needs to be able to tell the KDC exactly which service it wants to authenticate to. To be able to uniquely identify a service, we need a description of the service. This description of the service is its service principal name. The SPN is a name by which the client is able to uniquely identify the service to the KDC. This means if we run multiple instances of a given service, each and every instance of the service must have its own SPN. Equally, if there are multiple names a client might use to identify the machine where the service is running, we again need to have an SPN for each name. The SPN for a given service always includes the name of the machine where the service is running. Hence, if we have different names or aliases for a machine, we need to have multiple SPNs. So, a little more detail on the service principal name. So we've seen the client needs to use the service principal name to request access to a service but before the SPN can be used, it needs to be registered. If we consider the Windows world, the SPN needs to be registered against the account object that represents the service. This could be a user account or a computer account. 
each given SPN must only be registered against a single account. Registering the SPN twice or more will break Kerberos since the SPN will then not be unique. If you are going to register the SPN manually, you need to have right access to the account you're going to register it against. Typically, this means having domain administrator rights. An exception to that rule is the local system account. The local system account is able to register SPNs against the computer account. However, the automatically registered SPN must be of the form service class slash host, where the host part is the DNS name of the computer. So automatic registration cannot register an SPN containing a DNS alias. So what we've just discussed holds true for Windows and Active Directory. With MIT Kerberos, things are slightly different. A lot of the extra information found in Active Directory is not present in MIT Kerberos. In MIT Kerberos, it's just about authentication, whilst Active Directory is a full LDAP server and more. MIT Kerberos only stores the principal names and passwords. Nothing else is stored in the MIT Kerberos database. For user principal names, they have the form user at realm. Whilst for service principal names, they have the form service class slash host at realm. So we've talked about how the Kerberos protocol works at a high level and seen that the client gets a number of different tickets. Now we'll look at where the client keeps those. Each client, and in fact each user on each client, keeps their previously requested tickets in a ticket cache. The ticket cache contains both ticket granting tickets and service tickets that the end user on the client has requested. These are kept for the lifetime of the ticket or the lifetime of the end user session. Different clients store this ticket cache in different ways. Windows normally uses a memory cache, so if the machine is powered off, the ticket cache will be removed. On Unix systems, the default is to use a file cache, normally in the temp directory. However, this might be a memory based file system, meaning the cache isn't really written to disk. On Linux, it has traditionally been a file system cache like Unix systems. However, newer releases, such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, are moving towards a memory based cache more like Windows. So, how does the service go about validating the service ticket presented by the client? As we have said, the service needs to decrypt the messages sent by the client in order to validate the service ticket. As such, we need to provide the service with the correct credentials to use in decrypting the information from the client. There are two main ways to provide credentials to the service, and the mechanism used depends on the operating system. First, for many services on Windows, these use credentials in the run as service configuration. So, when you configure a service on Windows to run as a specific user, you enter the credentials as part of the service's definition. For other services, either on Windows or running on other operating systems, we use a file to provide the credentials to the service. This file is a Kerberos keytab. So what exactly is a Kerberos keytab? The Kerberos keytab 
is a file in a specific format which can contain multiple entries. It contains a collection of principles and the key associated with each principle. The key is associated with the password for that principle. The principles in the key tab can either be service principle names or user principle names. And the keys associated with each principle can be encrypted using different encryption algorithms. This means for a single principle, you might have several different entries corresponding to each encryption type. To summarize then, at a high level, what do we need to have to make Kerberos authentication work? First, we need to have a key distribution center with both the end users and services registered. The client needs to be able to access the KDC across the network to be able to first authenticate the end user and hence obtain the ticket granting ticket and then also to request access to the service. So to request the service ticket for a given service principal name by presenting the ticket granting ticket. The third head, the service, then needs to be able to validate the service ticket presented by the client. To be able to validate the service ticket, the service needs to have access to the credentials corresponding to the service principal name used by the client in the request for the service ticket. This has just been an introduction to Kerberos authentication. Quite possibly, whilst making some things more clear to you, this introduction might well have left you with further questions. So, if you want to explore more details, I have a number of additional sessions. Following on from this introduction, I have a Kerberos overview session. In this next session, we look in more detail at the different parts of Kerberos and have a look at what's inside the messages used as part of the Kerberos protocol. The session that follows on from the overview is an examination of the authentication process. In this follow-on session, we look at the details of the authentication process, we look at what items are encrypted by whom, and then how they are decrypted by the different parties. Finally, at this point, I have a session on advanced authentication processing. In this follow-on session, we extend beyond the authentication processing by looking at two more advanced cases, where we'll look at delegation and cross-realm authentication. Currently, these are all the sessions I've created. I may well add further sessions to look at other specific parts of making Kerberos authentication work for you. This completes our introduction of Kerberos authentication. For further information, you can see the following resources. The Kerberos protocol version 5 is defined in RFC 4120, available here. The GSS API protocol is defined in RFC 4121 and can be found here. And Microsoft have a great guide explaining how Windows implements Kerberos and you can find that here. Hopefully, this has given you a good introduction to Kerberos authentication. I hope this has helped you understand at a high level how Kerberos authentication works and some of the key parts you need to have in place before Kerberos will work for you. Please check back for the follow-on sessions on further Kerberos topics. Thank you and check back with your global enablement and learning team for more technical insights.